Um, oh, yeah. I'd like to call to order the uh, meeting of the Monona Sustainability Committee for Thursday, June 8th, 2023. Um, Thor, do you have the roll? Yes, we're all set. You do. And can I have a motion to approve the minutes from our April 13th committee meeting? I'll move approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any, uh, are there any changes? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes as written, say aye. 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 Fantastic, wonderful. Are there any appearances tonight, Thor? We do have one appearance. Wonderful. Um, um, and who is it? We've got, we've got <laughs> Jeff Pins. If you wanna come on up and take a seat, Jeff, you're on camera. And is what was it, Jeff? J -E yes. Fantastic. I just want to let you know, and I I don't know if you've spoken at committee meetings before, but if you haven't, it could be a little strange. Um, we are not allowed to have a conversation with you, and the reason is because all of our agendas and our meeting packets are made publicly available ahead of the meeting, so that all citizens know what we will be talking about. And so since there is an appearance section on the agenda, we allow folks to come in and speak, but we cannot have a discussion with you. So if you just hear a bunch of crickets after you speak, it's not because it's not because we feel what you've said is unworthy of a discussion. I just I just I know it can be strange uh, if you aren't familiar with that process. Well, I am, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this has to relate to actually a conversation that you and I had when we were at the San Damiano meeting. You bet. One of the things that I had uh, spoken about were rain gardens. And so uh, as my appearance and knowing that uh, there won't be any discussion about it, um, uh, I would like to just bring up the topic of, of rain gardens. And the reason I wanted to be at this meeting regarding the rain gardens would be two agenda items that you have for tonight's meeting. Uh, the one being the new business and you have the leaf management to top a storm drain campaign, but more so for number eight, uh, where with that you have the updates from committee members and uh, items for consideration for the future agenda. And so, more so, I'm, I'm here to be able to suggest that uh, rain gardens be something that could be brought forth for future agendas. And one of the things that I, I just wanted to start with is there, there's just so much information available regarding rain gardens, the positive impact that it has. And uh, one of the things, you know, for anyone who has recently driven on Dean Avenue, you can see with the new street work that they did, they have a lot of uh, cuts into the curbing, which then is, are flowing into rain gardens that uh, the neighbors are maintaining. And I live on Tony Watha Trail and right on the corner of actually Tony Watha Trail and Votes. And uh, our headache is right around the corner. And that is that uh, our section on Tony Awatha, it's going to be resurfaced. Our section on Boats Lane is going to have new curbs, uh, gutters, um, infrastructure type of work. And so in thinking about Dean Avenue and with new construction on the street and what they, uh, they did with the rain gardens, I was thinking this could be a, a good opportunity for the, the city to to get involved in something like that. And the city of Madison has a lot of information and their website just, you know, before the meeting, I just Googled Rain Garden City of Madison. And one of the things that popped up was the uh, Terrace Rain Gardens. And what it says is city engineering offers rain gardens in terraces in conjunction with street reconstruction and resurfacing projects where they are appropriate. The goal of the stormwater terrace program is to improve water quality by capturing and infiltrating stormwater runoff close to, to where it falls. And so 
you know, the opportunity continues every year in the city. There's there's also always the, the reconstruction of, of streets and such. And so, you know, as your agenda item of consider uh, items for consider uh, consider for future agendas, I was thinking that could be something to to add to a, a future agenda to be able to, to start getting some more information. Um, Alder Holmquist, as probably many of you know, has a rain garden. He's had his for uh, a number of years now. The neighbor across the street has one. I've been talking with Brian and he speaks highly of, of having the rain garden. He talks about it as being low maintenance to no maintenance of it. Um, and the um, the neighbor across the street, it looks like it's it's a very similar type of design that, that he has. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your your time. And uh, you know, if there's the uh, a rain garden uh, issue on future agendas, I'll probably see you all again then. <laughs> if not other <laughs> topics right. that you have. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. And thank you for the uh, referral to the City of Madison website. There are some wonderful resources there that I'm just looking through now. So that's wonderful. All right, great. So that brings us to the next area of our agenda, which is unfinished business. And 5A, focus on energy community events. Thor, would you mind um, giving us an update on that? Yeah, so uh, we have Brady starting out here with us tonight. He's going to give us a uh, presentation um, on residential energy saving uh, resources that are out there. And I think we'll also talk about potentially a community event. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pull up his slides and I'll turn it over to Brady. Wait, how about I sit here? If wherever you hear me better. Wherever okay. you're comfortable. Sounds good. Um, well, thanks everyone for having me. Um, my name is Brady Steigoff. I'm a community liaison manager at Focus on Energy. I'll talk a little bit about who we are in a little bit, but my role really is to connect with the community. Um, I thought I'd share with you some of the resources we have for residents. Um, there's also a lot more coming um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, but um, I think if, if this committee or some, some people in the community want to do a, a broader event maybe at a library or something this could be our demo um, and maybe we can organize something more broadly so we can get this information i was telling thor a little bit before um, the meeting that i monona to my knowledge is the only community that's done a residential energy survey to residents um, so there's some information on and residents are really interested in efficiency and renewables um, and their top barriers that they said to pursuing those projects are awareness of incentives out there, um, as well as uncertainty around paybacks. And when I saw that, I got really excited because I was like, that's what we do. So I think those are some of the best barriers that we, we could see a community having, because um, that's what we address. So with that, um, maybe I'll dive right in. Um, I'm planning to intro what Focus on Energy is, um, kind of build the case for why I care about efficiency, and then dive into our resources and our incentives. So um, what Focus on Energy is, is we are a statewide efficiency and renewable incentive program. In other states, the model is sort of each utility runs their own program. In Wisconsin, we have one program that's statewide. So we partner with Madison Gas and Electric and other 107 other utilities in the state um, to deliver incentives. We're funded by bills, but in turn, we give money back to customers um, for incentives, especially to go beyond standard models to more efficient ones, so that those customers, residents, businesses um, have lasting energy savings um, for the future. Um, and uh, we just got evaluated by a third party um, evaluator that found for every dollar a program costs, uh, we save $4.55 back into the economy with paying a local contractor. And then all those um, energy bills that people were spending money on energy now can go back into local communities um, or employees, it's a business, so. 
that's a little bit about us. Um, sorry about the Sun Prairie's utility. I, I've done this presentation in so many communities, I sometimes um, miss stuff when I read out the slides. Do the next slide. So why I care about efficiency? There's a lot of benefits. So you save money on your energy. Um, it actually helps the whole system because the grid gets stressed when more people use energy, especially as we're plugging more and more things into it. Um, so that can help keep rates low in the future when you save energy. Um, energy efficient homes and buildings are healthier, so they have better ventilation. Should you have bad wildfires, um, they're healthier for our respiratory systems when we're more efficient. It makes homes more comfortable, especially um, drafty homes have a lot of opportunity to save money on energy and become more comfortable. It can lower our environmental footprint by using less fuels and resources, um, especially a lot of the electricity or heating source is natural gas or coal. Um, even in that, as that's changing, we'll need less resources the more energy we're using wisely. And there's also lots of incentives from MG&E to focus on energy and then soon the Inflation Reduction Act um, is to lower the upfront costs. Um, a little bit about the potential that we have to save. So there's an uh, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy came up with a report that deep energy retrofits, so really focusing on home projects to save energy, can save half of a home's energy use as well as half their emissions. And since Wisconsin is really cold, there's actually an even bigger opportunity. So it's about 80% uh, in pre-1950s homes, 75% energy savings in uh, homes built after 1970s. And in both cases, it's nearly a half um, carbon reduction. Next slide. Um, on the left, I've got different types of homes. And then this bar chart shows um, different end uses of energy. So things, this sort of shows you the opportunity. I know there's a kind of a lot of information on this slide. The biggest takeaway is that your heating and air conditioning are more than half of your home's energy usage. So when we talk about ways to lower your bills or save money on energy, that's where you should target first. Um, on electric, there's uh, appliances and lighting, which is about 25%. Um, as more people switch to electric heating, I think too, as the grid gets cleaner, more people are gonna maybe wanna do that. Um, this might change, but uh, water heating, which is also normally natural gas, is also about 20%. So natural gas savings are, you know, about 70% of what you could save in your home, or at least those uses are where the biggest bang for your buck is going to be. Um, I've got a slide that just kind of shows some different ways to do projects. Um, the first one, retrofit A, is probably the least relevant to most people because it's a new home. Um, but B and C are sort of two-stage approaches. The main takeaway is if you really want to start with the most cost-effective things that will really make the biggest impact for the planet and the wallet, it always starts with insulating your air ceiling. Um, and so I'll dive more into that programs there um, in a little bit. I wanted to talk about the resources that we have. So this will kind of help you. Um, I'll, I'll first talk about our resources, but then we also have money to do all those projects to help lower that upfront cost. Um, a lot of our programs are for single family homeowners, but we do have some stuff for renters, so I'll get into that as well. In terms of resources, our website is focusonenergy.com. Um, it's a really great place to find everything I'm going to talk about today. Um, we do have products um, that I'll talk about later in the presentation, but also our rebates are in, and incentives are where you fill out an application. And then um, in about a month or two after you submit one, you get a rebate check in the mail for doing more efficient things. Um, and we've also got the resource tab which is where some of the things in this section we'll talk about. Um, welcome. Okay, next slide. Um, I wanted to mention we have a blog too. So this has a lot of great resources on um, things like how to take advantage of the federal tax credits. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in these slides, um, but we've got things like that. We've got uh, positive stories like schools reducing energy use, um, and then everything from like, which insulation should I choose from? So just a lot of great resources there. Also have a YouTube channel, um, which has just different information in a different format. If you like videos, um, we also have some different uh, series. So one of the most popular ones is a net zero energy home that was just built um, in Dane County. 
Um, someone went through the whole process of designing that new building, um, but it might give you ideas if you have an existing home or projects you might want to pursue. Uh, we do also have a free online home energy assessment tool. It takes about 15 minutes. It's not as good as getting a home energy audit, which we'll talk about a little later, but if you just don't know where to begin, this is a free, quick, easy way to kind of learn some opportunities. Um, it'll, and it'll give you some estimates of if you do these different projects, how much it might save you on your bills too. So it's kind of a, a quick and dirty version. Uh, this tool I really want to highlight. So this is finding a trade ally, which is also just like a trusted contractor with focus on energy. These are people who, whether you want solar, you can look for, or furnaces, air source heat pumps, um, energy assessments. There's a different what service do you need that you can search for. You can also do women-owned, um, disabled veteran, or minority-owned uh, business if you're interested in that. We also now have a Spanish feature as well for Spanish language, but um, you enter your zip code and you can find this you have plenty in Dane County um, to choose from to do the work. But they're trusted by Focus on Energy. They can help you fill out a rebate if you're curious. And they also will be very knowledgeable about more efficient products as well. All right. Any questions on that or, or people online before I dive into the money that we have? But the trade ally, are you limited to those people on the on the website or can you hire people beyond that? If you have a contractor in mind and they're not a trade ally, which most are, the, the process is pretty easy for them. Um, to become a trade to ally? To become a trade ally. Okay. They won't know about our rebates, basically. Okay. If, if you work with just anybody. Okay. Um, but you can, I think, apply for a rebate on your own, sort of like DIY, if you know how to do the work. Okay, or, okay. So. Okay, good to know. Thank yeah. you. Is there an income cutoff? Um, how people? Uh, <laughs> That's we, what I've seen. Yeah, so so there's, there's an energy assistance program that does have an income um, cutoff. That's a different program from ours where we serve anybody. Um, so there's obviously an upfront cost to buying efficient products sometimes, um, but we do. So the energy assistance program is 60% area median income and below qualifies for that. We're everything above, but we offer almost double the incentives for people who are 60% to 80% area median income to try to bridge that gap. Bridge that gap. So we know that in, you know, when you're just on the cusp of qualifying for a program, it's really hard, right? So it's sort of the best we're able to do with our state statute um, requirements. Can you find that help? Um, that's on our website. And when you apply for a rebate, Oh, okay. We also have like a thing that pops up, like, are you income eligible? Mm -hmm. Also, if you um, are eligible for like SNAP or Magicare, any of those things, you're automatically qualified. Um, you don't even have to do much extra work. So trying to make it as easy as we can for you all. Cool. Um, so um, the we, have a, kind of this... we have a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One. One other question was um, with the Inflation Reduction Act rebates rolling out, and a lot of those are handled sort of federally through tax credits, then there'll be some through uh, state-based rebates. I'm curious what role or like kind of how Focus on Energy is working to integrate those programs with all the Focus on Energy's offerings. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so um, there's, there's a lot in the Inflation Reduction Act. So the tax credits are available now and I've actually included them in these slides. Um, you could take advantage of the tax credits and you could take advantage of Focus on Energy. And sometime next year, we're not certain on the time, you'll be able to take advantage of, there are some federal rebates. Those went to the State Public Service Commission who voted unanimously to have Focus on Energy be the vehicle to distribute those. Mm. So it'll work as like a separate program that's also run by us because we have a statewide infrastructure and we're gonna be one of the first states to roll this out because we have the statewide infrastructure. Um, every other state has to figure out how to do a statewide program when they don't have one. Um, those won't be available until next year. Um, those are, there'll be a separate website, but if you go to Focus on Energy, we'll be linking back and forth so that people know 
they could take advantage of as many resources available to them to do these projects. Um, there are two types of rebates that are federal. There's a home performance one, which will start with an energy assessment or audit. Um, and then you can get $2,000 if you can save about 2,000, if you can save 20% of your whole home's energy use. And then you get 4,000 if you can save 35% of your home's energy use. We're not sure how we verify that yet. Um, those are some of the details that we're starting to work out as we get more guidance from the federal government. Um, if you're income qualified, which I think is 80% state median income or below, those numbers double. So if you can receive, if you can get through the 20% reduction, you get 4,000 instead of 2,000. Or if you get the 35,000, you get $8,000 rather than 4,000. There's another one that's entirely income eligible that is for electric equipment. So induction stoves, air source heat pumps, they almost cover the entire cost to electrify a home, but they're income eligible. So kind of what we've been saying for people right now is I wouldn't wait because we really don't know when we'll have some of the guidance and when we'll be able to give out those federal rebates. They'll only be available for 10 years um, until funds last. And then maybe <coughs> the states that didn't decide to run these programs, like North Dakota and South Dakota, that funds might go, and other states might go back to states that have programs. Um, but basically, the best time to save energy is right now, because the more months that you have lower bills, um, the more things are paying back for themselves. And the tax credits you'll see in a little bit are pretty hefty as well um, and they're for, for anybody. So I think if you're not income restricted um, and you're curious about doing energy projects, there's, there's already quite a bit of resources out there. Um, there's just, there, there will be a little bit more next year too. All right, so I hope I didn't um, leave the Sun Prairie Utilities. So Sun Prairie Utilities, if, if they are in here, they, they provide some bonus rebates. Um, if, let's see if I did or not. Okay, good, I didn't. Um, so as you can see, I've got the federal tax credits in the middle column, and then what Focus on Energy will provide you. So for insulation, the way we give rebates are sort of what part of the home. So we give the most to attics. Um, and your top floor of the home, because that's the biggest energy savings, but there's everything from the walls, um, other parts of the home as well. We give up to nearly 2000, and then you can sort of see for the income qualified, we offer um, about $700 more as well. On top of that, you'll be eligible for a federal tax credit um, up to 30% of the cost, up to 1200 for that. I mentioned a home energy audit, which is gonna make you eligible for the federal rebates. Um, this is also a really good thing to do. Even if you did one 10 years ago, we recommend doing it again. Um, there's new technologies and stuff out there that have made things that weren't cost-effective now so. Um, and what's really great is that now um, they cost about 500 to 800, but you'll get tailored recommendations to your home. You'll know exactly where the best opportunities are to save. Um, which is going to be even better than me giving my presentation, which is like my best guess. Um, but there's a federal tax credit up to $150 to lower the cost of that too. Uh, and again, you'd want to go through a focus on energy trade alley or the trusted contractors um, to get one of those. And there's plenty in Madison to do that. Um, they'll also mention, here's the paybacks of everything that you could do. And here's all the um, incentives available to you to do those projects. Um, we don't provide a incentive for windows or skylights just because the payback's longer, but there's um, a $600 tax credit now available. Um, these tax credits, I should mention, are available for the next 10 years for projects. So there's not really a rush to get those. Um, also, exterior doors have a tax credit as well. Um, and so I guess this is a redundant slide, but we've got the free home energy assessment tool. So maybe if you're, if you don't want to, schedule an actual home energy audit to start, um, this might be a good first step just to maybe see how efficient your home is. Um, apologies for the redundancy on these slides. Um, any questions on insulation before I do 
each category. All right. Let's talk heating and cooling. So air source heat pumps are a newer technology. Um, I actually was looking to see if all of the things might have them, but I'm not positive. Um, we're actually pretty familiar with this technology. Your air conditioner is sort of a less efficient version of an air source heat pump, and your refrigerator is an air source heat pump. So they work by pumping heat rather than burning fuel. They run off electricity. Um, if you think about your refrigerator, it pumps the heat from in your fridge out into your apartment all year round. Um, there's now cold climate air source heat pumps that can work in reverse. So even down to negative 15 degrees, they can pull heat from the air and warm your home in the winter. Um, they can also work with your furnace. So on the really cold days when it's a little bit harder and less efficient for it to do that, it can run on your furnace. Um, but for the rest of the year, it runs very efficiently. Um, and while they're newer to Wisconsin, they're very popular in Europe um, and as well as on the, the coast where they're a little bit milder temperature. Now there's just some technology adaptation to make them work, even in our cold climate, to heat your home. Um, they're up to four times more efficient than any air conditioner or furnace, just because they're moving heat and energy rather than burning something to create it. Um, Geothermal is a very similar technology, just instead of pulling that from the air, they're pulling it from in the ground where it's about a constant 50 degree temperature. Um, when you, once you go about six feet down. Um, so focus on energy and federal tax credits available to help offset the cost. Those are more expensive. So that's where you can see a little bit higher incentives there. Um, the, there's a federal tax credit for Energy Star central air conditioning as well as um, for furnaces, Focus on Energy provides um, a sort of smaller incentive of 150 for more efficient. Um, but if you're income eligible, we, we give $550 for a higher efficient furnace. And then again, you can stack those with uh, the tax credit. Any questions on heating and cooling or what an air source heat pump is? <laughs> They're kind of magical. We kind of in the energy industry, we think they're like one of the newer, they're kind of like the LEDs of heating and cooling. Um, but I will say, unless your home is really tight and, and insulated and air sealed, um, electricity is more expensive than natural gas, even as natural or gas is really skyrocketing in price lately. Um, so unless your home is really, really air conditioned and tight or air sealed and tight, um, your bills will probably go up if you switch. Um, but if you care about carbon, they're kind of the way to go because they run on electricity rather than natural gas. Um, and a good, in the middle, in the meantime, like if you have a furnace and it's got a lot of good life, um, you could run your furnace less and it might last longer if you do, um, if you attach a heat pump to it, it's called dual fuel. Um, it'll just save the life of your furnace and you'll be using almost 80% less natural gas. Um, and it'll have your thermostat will do the work of deciding when you want to save uh, money on energy or if carbon is your, your goal to save, but it can play with that as well. Can it be coupled with a propane fueled? It can do that too. And that's where you really see a lot of savings because propane is so much more expensive than natural gas. Oh. Um, so you can hardly run propane. Um, and so it works with that too, especially cabins and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'll mention, so what we were funded is from natural gas and electric bills. So since propane isn't included in that, the incentive is a little smaller from us. Um, when the Inflation Reduction Act rebates come through, those are fuel neutral. So like anybody, or what fuel you have, you can have wood burning stove and covered by that. Those are the things that don't, um, aren't available till next year. Yeah. Okay. So. I have a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Brady. Thank you for being right. here. I'm Teresa. Um, I feel like I may owe you an apology because when we invited you to come to a meeting, I don't recall if I ever asked you about the length of your presentation. Okay. I want to make sure we I want to make sure we made enough space 
for you to get through your presentation. But um, I think good. I, yeah. Um, that, that's on me, Teresa. Brady did yeah. uh, ask me if, if a half hour seemed appropriate, and, and I I said that seemed okay. I thought you were CC'd on that email, mm -hmm. but maybe not. Okay. So I, I apologize. Uh, that's okay. Uh, and then, Brady, am I, am I understanding correctly that? Um, I apologize if you can hear this dog. I'm going to close my door here. Um, am I understanding correctly that you hope to present a similar presentation to, let's say, a group at the library? And tonight is sort of like just a preview of what that might look like. Yes. Yes. OK. And I also believe that everything on your PowerPoint will be shared with us. And yeah. it's also available on the Focus on Energy website. Yeah. OK. Great. So we, Those were my only questions. Okay. Would you like me to fly through the, maybe the last slides then? Would you mind? mind? Would you mind? Yeah. Yeah, not at all. Thank you. Um, so we got some, we have rebates for water heaters as well. Um, maybe we could just keep going. Another way to save on water is just obviously using less of it. We'll also save on your hot water. So we have um, on our online marketplace instant rebates on these equipment. Go next slide. Uh, we offer rebates instantly on smart thermostats as well. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we also offer free energy saving packs. This is the most popular program. Even shipping is free. Um, you could order them online um, or you could call uh, mg &E and they could um, link you to our call line as well to order one of these, also in Spanish. Um, so we offer different materials. Online marketplace, we also sell um, different things like air purifiers and things that are Energy Star certified. Um, and then we also offer a $500 um, solar award um, if you get solar panels. And I wanted to mention too that MDE has a program to offset. Um, you pay a little bit extra on your bill, but you get 100% of your energy from renewables that they reserve on your behalf that they then don't get credit for. The state. Brady, thinking about that green power uh, now, is that green power tomorrow? Is that the same? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Program? That's what it's called. Oh, right. okay. And are there any municipalities that have joined green power tomorrow? There are some, um, by especially the ones that are trying to reach the 25 by 25, mm -hmm. um, because technically you can't claim, you can claim the grid saving, grid efficiency and and renewables if you're talking about carbon dioxide, but if you're talking about what energy is the city causing to be green, you have to either buy credits or they need to be on your roofs offsetting your energy usage to claim that. Um, so it's just kind of a little nuance in the energy world, um, but I do see quite a bit of cities um, choosing to do some on-site renewable, as well as do programs like Green Power Tomorrow um, to reach that goal. And then while well, that does cost a little bit extra, in the meantime, they try to do rooftop solar to, to lower their bills as well. So I apologize for the Sun Prairie Utilities references in here. Obviously, if I did it in the community, we would, we would scratch those. But um, maybe I'll ask just a question. Do you think this would be valuable to share with residents? Well, I think we have an expert right in the room. I know that Sue works with the library. I do. I do work with the library programs, the Eco Action oh, Tuesday programs. Um, yes, we have done some things like this, but we haven't done them recently. And I think people are very interested. I think the, um, the, the general feeling I have is the faster we get it out to the public, the better. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people need to know that, and if they have, options for resources, it's very important because that often is the thing that's holding people up. Mm -hmm. But we, our programs are monthly. Um, we have them booked until December, I believe. Wow. But um, we are certainly willing to have you back. I mean, I think this would be a great program, mm -hmm. um, again, for people to hear 
Um, it's not unfamiliar to me, and we have seen other programs like it at the library before, but different people come. So, you know, I mean, it's certainly, um, certainly something we would welcome. Sue, so what would you recommend as Sue? What would you recommend as next steps if Brady wanted to reach out to the library, or is that a next step? Is that oh, what? you can. I mean, I, I can take this to Penny, and we'll. Okay. In <laughs> December, we might be able to talk more about the rebates mm -hmm. that I the federal ones. Um, yeah, what well, would be um, going into January probably, right. or or actually we skipped the worst months because people don't want to come up. <laughs> yeah, <that's fair. laughs> we'd like you to have an audience. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as we finish that schedule, mm -hmm. but we, that would be great because I think the sooner we do it, the better. And, um, and that would mm -hmm. take the pressure off Penny for figuring out what that first one is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're scrambling to find, you know, the, get the whole agenda set because we set it for mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. Um, so but it's the have, fourth Tuesday of the month. Is that right? It's the fourth Tuesday of the month. Okay. So you're thinking maybe January. And about nine, it's about nine months of the year. It, okay. it depends a lot on, you know, where, whether we can drum up the, yeah. the, the speakers and, you know, have issues yeah. that we really want to, to do. But Well, I was thinking if you're open to this, we could also invite mg &E because they've got, I think they've got an electric vehicle program as well. Mm. And we could also, I mean, and they also yeah. just have other resources. We too. just had their electrical. Oh, well then <laughs> we're, we're connected with you. We are supported yeah, by you. So we're, um, we're into that already. But yes. But at least I'm yeah, sure we just had a wonderful, it, yeah. it drew a huge crowd. The e-bikes. The e-bike presentation. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was You're great. talking about cars. Yeah. 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 It was, and we've had the electric vehicles as okay. well. We had oh. e-bikes and, and e-cycle uh, together as an event. Okay. And, so I have I have two questions. Um, Brady, is there anything that you feel that the sustainability committee that it's critical that we communicate immediately to the citizens of Monona, or is this uh, information something that could uh, be worked into the library schedule? I think two things. Um, I think I'd love to start scheduling that event sure. um, and just talking about what we want for the agenda. Um, on the information, I would share the the energy audit information and the insulation is like one of the best ways to save. Um, right. Just because I think uh, there's a lot of utilities that are out there looking to, for rate increases just because the cost of fuels have gone up from the war in Ukraine. Um, so I think bills are kind of going to go up in the future and they're already I think this winter, everybody was like, wow, I can't believe the impact that had. Um, and this is a really like the best tool that people have mm -hmm. um, for their home and it makes it more comfortable. And totally well, agree. There's totally always agree. a I have turnover of housing yeah. too. So, and a lot of new people in the community. So, I mean, that they're the people yeah. that are going to want to know yeah. what their options are. Yeah. And they don't know their home homes yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. So I have a question for this body. Is there someone in the room that would, that what, what are, is there an action that needs to be taken now? And if so, what does it look like? And who would be interested in taking the action? Just gonna throw that out there. Um, Can I suggest that we talk about um, the action items under eight? Sure. I think where we have possible energy task force, we have the My Monona yep. e-newsletter. Those are all topics, and I think yep. those would all be places where that would that would be it. Absolutely, I would support that, Sarah. Thank you. For the time being, what I'm hearing is that Sue is going to sort of be the liaison for Brady at the library. Is that? Sure. And did I that understand that correctly? Okay. Yep. Okay, perfect. <laughs> You're in super good hands. Sue's, a, Sue's an old head at the library. She knows exactly how they how they do everything over there. All right. Is there anything else, Brady, that that you weren't able to? Nope. I think if you're interested in sharing something out in the community, you could always reach out to me and I can help draft something. Okay. It's obviously a very technical world out there. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. It was great. Yeah. So uh, we have a pretty heavy agenda tonight, but I'm confident if we just keep moving, we can get through it fairly reasonably. So 
Item 5B, pollinator habitat and no mole may project update. So um, I will start by saying that um, a small uh, work group has formed off of the spring campaign and uh, it, it, it has uh, met one time. And what happened was, um, you know, as no mo may is just exploding in this community, um, as you know, there's been some conversation about how perhaps the finer nuances behind, you know, why we should do these sorts of things might be in need of more clarification and communication. You know, it's it's really all about letting little flowers grow in your grass as, you know, if you have Kentucky bluegrass and only Kentucky bluegrass, it's not really that beneficial to let your grass grow and it may actually cause troubles. So what I did was I reached out to folks who had applied to be on the sustainability committee, but there just wasn't any room for them to be a part of the official committee, reached out to them. We had some nice, res like, nice return. Uh, Kristen and Sue and Thor and I and Ashley too. No, wait a minute. Is that the only just Kristen and Sue? Yeah. We Ashley just made the bookmarks. <clears throat> did she not? Ashley made the bookmarks, but as far as like the meeting, when we Zoom, Zoom met with some folks, uh, yeah, there were two folks from the community. Anyway, we had a lot of discussion about how we might move beyond No Mo May and, and to the appearance tonight. We talked a lot, little bit about rain gardens. We talked a little bit about flowering gardens, bee lawns, um, replacing clover in our uh, Kentucky bluegrass mix. Talked a lot about a lot of strategies. The idea was that we would submit something in the, the e-newsletter that would let Residents know that if they were interested in continuing the conversation beyond no mo may, we'd like to meet with them. Or, I, oh, and we also, once the newsletter came out, we printed off the article and just some of us just went door to door. And if there, if a person had a no mo may sign out in front of their doorway, um, we just dropped off. A, I went through over 50 flyers. Um, so Thor, what did we get? Like 20, over 20 responses? Yeah. Um, I, I did hear from some people who got your flyer, actually. They were like, how do I sign up? This is great. So that was a great idea, Teresa. And we have, uh, 22 responses for the, the, the bee and butterfly brigade, as we're calling yeah. it. So I, I did include the list in the meeting packet to protect everyone's privacy, sure. but we have <clears throat> addresses and email addresses for, for, uh, 22 folks. That's spectacular. Talk about citizen engagement. That's spectacular. So, so that's kind of where we're at right now. We got 22 interested people. My thoughts and and Ashley and Sue, if if this fits into your schedule, uh, I'm, I'm putting this out to you since you're the two committee members that were part of the meeting. Um, uh, do you think the the next best step just would be to reach out to these folks and find a time when we can all get on a Zoom meeting together or what are your thoughts? Does that sound reasonable to you? Do you have a goal in mind of what what that would what the purpose of that group would would do? I mean, that you could clarify for everyone. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the people that was most sort of um, oh, I don't know how do you want to say it. This one of the the folks that is sort of taking in a little bit of a leadership role. Um, he had suggested that maybe we do some pilot sites throughout the city. Um, maybe people would um, volunteer to have their front yard, you know, planted as a bee lawn or just do like low growing uh, plants like clover and creeping thyme. And uh, what is another? There were some other plants that uh, we watched. We had a, a wonderful presentation that we watched, uh, a webinar that we all attended. So that's one of the things, Sue, that might come about from this. We might work with people to, you know, there might be an appetite for some rain gardens. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, if you're asking me. I was actually asking for the for clarification for the group too, just so that they would not cut. So I think your question was, what was the goal of this committee? The goal of the group is, yeah. is potentially to come up with a strategy, because we had also talked about whether we wanted to do the formal B-City kind of thing. And right. I know that 
some people felt one way and some the other, I think, on right. that. I don't, there were pluses and minuses, I think, to doing that. Um, so I don't know if, I mean, if you do do that, then the, the goal of the committee, I think, would be kind of focused on meeting all those criteria that that, that does, that those criteria will kind of have to be met anyway, but, you yeah. know, it's not necessarily needed that we join, I think, and uh, there were, I know there was some discussion uh, in the amongst people who considered it or had had become members that um, there were, were some obstacles when they had to get things through committees, you know, formally with the governance. <laughs> you know, it's almost easier to set it all up beforehand and then said, here it is, <laughs> take it and go. So uh, that was my take on what I heard of all the different feedbacks that they had. But, but I don't know how you, I, I don't know if you looked at the same stuff exactly or, or I, well, you know. Thank you for reminding me because yes, you're right. One of the things we talked about indeed was, you know, pursuing the city USA status. That was definitely one of the things that, that came up. Yeah. So I think what makes sense or probably makes sense now that we've got a list of interested people, we've got contact information for folks, we can um, send out an invitation for a Zoom meeting and just um, find out where people are at and where their interests are. And maybe some of them drop out and that's okay. Maybe we, you know, land on a group of 10 people that works on, you know, building pollinator habitat on residential spaces. And that's okay too, you know? Or what would, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think it'd be uh, really important to identify kind of a, a project leader from, from that group. Mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. On the committee, I think Tim might be that person. Right. That's what I'm thinking too. Um, so we should double check with him. Um, and See you know, if he wants, wants to take do. the lead <laughs> in, in creating kind of a strategy, I, I think that's great. And then we can kind of be a support for that that citizen group. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. I wanted to add um, to we also talked about the possibility of uh, having a dedicated um, um, you know, test plot, let's see, in a park space, or like even at MG21, which I haven't gotten a response back from them oh, yet, yes. but I did reach out, so I'm hoping they'll have a little more time to consider this and meet with us, perhaps, um, but I don't know if, you know, there would be, this group might also want to be involved in that kind of a space as well, because it would require some volunteer leadership. Mm -hmm. I know they formerly were involved. I mean, there is a rain garden in Winnipeg Park that was done by, I don't know how much it's been maintained, <laughs> but but certainly it has. And, and that's one issue with schools is, you know, the, the group that plants it doesn't necessarily continue to, you know, they grow up, grow up and go, go away. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's a little harder to get them excited about <laughs> maintaining it. <laughs> so I, I don't know, but, but, that certainly is a possibility. Yes, and on their own property, I think it would more likely happen, perhaps. Um, so, but anyway, just a few thoughts. Very <laughs> <Or> good. Experiences. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, I think suffice it to say, No More May was very successful. We had some participation from city, uh, public works, um, the library had a nice little space. Um, we went through, Gosh, 75 signs, did we? No. Uh, well, we, we printed 50 and we have, we have seven left. Seven left. Sorry. Were you and counting the just... three that I still have? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me about those. Okay. We've got 10 left. <laughs> and that was just 50 this year because in previous right, years, they were... Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, public works took like, you know, four or five, I think. So. We'll make yeah, sure I, they hold on to those for next year. Yeah, I don't know how popular the Herald Independent is with this group, but I also had a uh, a reporter reach out to me, and we had a story in the Herald Independent, and then we also obviously had a story in the My Minoni e newsletter. And I think the message is really that, hey, we've got your attention. No Mome is very visible, and that's wonderful. But now 
what's next, right? Let's move beyond it because it's just, it's a good place to start, but it's not a magic bullet that fixes everything. So, but it definitely is a wonderful attention grabber. All right, fabulous. Um, so if there's nothing more, I'm happy to move on to the next uh, topic, which is review and possible recommendations to the city council for an ordinance amendment to chapter 263-5 of the Minnesota Municipal Code of Ordinances regarding the regulation of lawns. My goodness. Thor, would you like to lead us through that? Yeah, I'll uh, take the lead here. So at our last meeting, we reviewed some draft language and we had a, a few comments. So I made those changes and then since then, the ordinate, the draft language has been reviewed by uh, the city's code enforcement officer, the planning department, the public works department, uh, the fire chief, and then also our legal counsel. So um, those departments had a, a couple comments. There weren't too many uh, major changes. Code enforcement didn't have any changes. Um, legal just made a few um, changes to make it more enforceable. For instance, in changing the term undesirable wildlife to just rodents, you know, making things more specific like that. <laughs> you don't want to be rude to the desirable. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and planning had a, a couple comments to, to more clearly define lawns, you know, how the city defines street lawns versus side yards versus rear yards etc so that language got added the the major change was that public works felt very strongly that we had reduced the setbacks um, from 10 feet down to five feet that's mm -hmm. what madison does and public works felt very strongly that it needed to stay at 10 feet and said that they they would speak up at city council meeting and uh, against the ordinance change if we kept it at 10 and that's because they, when they're doing work on right of way, they needed that extra space to, to get equipment in there. And so they were worried about, you know, with, with only a five foot setback, it might lead to a lot of damage to, to the, the lawns and, and also potentially to their equipment, especially if these lawns are, you know, the native planting areas are, are like lined with large rocks, you know, which is, um, one of the requirements here to have that and natural or clearly defined border so um would it be possible for that to be only though the like there could be two sentences so that it would be 10 feet away from public right-of-way areas but it could be five feet away from shared driveways and other property lines or something like that yeah I, I think that's i think you know that when we just talked about it and cut it to five it was because if it's 10 feet on all sides you might have a no quite a small little square <laughs> that you're not working no. with right. and i you know if their problem is just the right of way along the That's curb it. then you know could you at least have a little bit more of a cushion on the other sides of that yeah i i think that makes sense and i'll, I'll run it past the public works director but um i don't know why they would i don't see like property lines how that would have why, why they would care or, yeah, yeah so if we cut it to five there so five everywhere yeah so just keep the 10 at the the from like the curve concern of the, the right of way yeah sure unless there are some kind of property drainage issues that i don't but, but i that think that would seem... still be considered that would be the public right away if there's a city owned like if there's yeah but i mean draining onto other property <laughs> you know each other's you don't want your the water on your property ever draining onto your neighbor's property oh well that i mean this really, would this might be changing the grade or anything though <laughs> so so it shouldn't yeah that's the type of i mean if anything less. it would retain water and it would right. run less water into your right if, if it's five yeah if it's a smaller area it would be better correct up long right, right. it like or right yeah it, it, that's re required yeah, um, turf. yeah yes Okay, so 7A will keep at the 10 foot setback, but 7C, we like to adjust that to five, five yeah. for um, property. property lines between private property owners, essentially. Yeah, mm -hmm. like essentially cut the last phrase of that sentence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, and also sidewalks, but sidewalks are in the right away, so that seems redundant. Yeah, that's a little redundant. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll run that past 
public works and right. we'll see what they think. That's good. I have, okay. a, question. I have a question. Yep. Um, you limit natural lawns sometimes 25% of the total square footage, sometimes 50%, I think. Yeah, so I think that would be appropriate for us to discuss as well. That was, we had conversations about how are we going to define what a natural lawn is so that maybe regulations don't apply to someone who's having a, a small planting that um, it falls under this ordinance. But those percentages were taken from um, here, municipalities, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, so what Madison does is you don't need a permit as long as you're meeting these requirements. If you go beyond that, then you would need a permit. Oh. Um, what so it's not just setting a ceiling, it's also a floor of like when you need a permit, right? Yeah, yeah, that's how Madison does it. Right. Once, you, once your natural lawn is large enough, then you would need a permit and a natural lawn management plan. That's what Monona used to require is that for any natural lawn, you had to get a permit and submit a natural lawn management plan. We had one resident do that in the history of the ordinance over a couple of decades. So okay. the goal here is just to, to make everything simpler, just give residents okay. the right to have a natural lawn, as long as they're meeting oh. some minimum standards. So one of those is limiting the size, but- Because we're still requiring them to maintain it in certain ways and not have invasive species you can't and all those kind of, you can't just go around and <laughs> so say I'm not gonna do anything. 50% or less, they don't need a permit. If it's 50% or or more than 50%, then they need a permit. Well, so the way that we've crafted this is that no permits necessary, but you have to keep it smaller than that 25% oh. or 50%. But if someone wanted to do their whole loan, it couldn't. The way that we've crafted it oh. right now, um, and maybe I, I, I think that would be, would be appropriate for the committee to discuss okay. today. Um, if there's changes you want to see here, um, otherwise it could be something that and this is kind of like a, a pilot that we roll out and we see how it goes and you can always tweak it. I, I have a question that Rick sort of um, took the, beat me to it. Um, you know, when we're talking about a bee lawn or a flowering lawn, if a person were to tear out all of their Kentucky bluegrass and only plant clover, is there anything about that that wouldn't apply here because the clover would stay below eight inches. Yep. yep. Oh. So as long as you're just mowing it, keeping it short, you can have all the non, you know, bluegrass that you, yeah, you can have little tiny flowering plants. Your whole yard could be purple and pink and white, and but it's just very short to the ground. Okay. I'm just trying to think of, you know, our property. Yeah. In our goal is to get rid of all the grass, so we yeah. don't have to do any mowing. But it's it's a wide variety of garden types, mm -hmm. and um, for the side yard, you know, there's probably less than fifty percent grass. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't trigger anything here. It's only if you do what we're prescribed as natural laws, right? Which would be native plants that are intended to grow taller than eight inches okay. which would so you couldn't do the whole thing in milkweed or something but you could do it all in clover okay well but if it were set back right you right i mean if it were well, set it's still back, not going to be the whole thing though i mean if, if yeah but yeah it's you're gonna have to i mean if it's 10 feet if we keep the 10 feet on all sides yeah. you may still be maintaining quite a bit of yeah. grass space yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. and we have like like a bee or butterfly garden, and I'm sure it's less than ten feet from the side uh, from the curb. So I mean, I think I'm wondering how would you describe me? <laughs> it seems to me like you know we're setting ourselves up for a problem, with, but you know we've done that before. Yeah, I, I will say that you know the current ordinance also does not allow yeah look like a natural lawn okay. within 10 feet of uh, the same setbacks apply right now yeah. say yeah yeah okay. but i wouldn't 
I wouldn't say, I mean, Rick, you, you just have like these gigantic rose bushes. Your, your, your front yard is just in bloom. It's incredible. And then you have mown paths between the, these large flowering plants. Right. I mean, you're and you keep it short. I think it's, grass, now we do, yeah. I think it's fine. I think in summers past, we did get sighted once or twice. You did? Oh. <laughs> um, okay. I, I had another question too. Please. Um, at one point, we cite the UW extension as kind of a mediation service. There's a disagreement. Yeah. That about was... whether or not it's uh, maturity height. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the way Madison has it in there. Exactly. Order. exactly. Yeah. But do they know that we're referencing them in our ordinance? They don't. I, I didn't reach out to them. Okay. We I don't think it would be uncommon for UW Extension to get called in on yeah. very bizarre things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think we just wanted to identify a neutral yeah. A neutral subject matter expert. I, I yeah. would certainly let them know if that would make you more comfortable. I, I would definitely let them know because I know when I worked at the State Historical Society, we were sometimes referenced in and it kind of caught us off guard. And we don't like to be in the middle of a fight if there is some <laughs> sort of nastiness going on or anything. So it, it might be worth, they might have a suggestion of how to word that better. I think a professional courtesy is always a good idea. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that Thor would reach out to someone and, and just make sure it's okay. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, we do that. Are there any other concerns about the ordinance as it reads? Or are we ready to approve it and send it on to city council. Well, here's my last question, I promise. Um, I don't know if there's a defined reference for what is a natural plant in Wisconsin. A, a native plant? A native. Um, so I don't know if it's a, uh, how you could legally enforce that if there isn't some objective standard. I mean, it does list a state statute and the Wisconsin Natural Resources Administrative Rule. That statute applies to the weeds, right? Not just weeds. I, isn't it just like anything that's not on that list would be essentially considered safe in Wisconsin then? Because it's not invasive. So, like, what's on that list would be considered an invasive or a weed that's not right. healthy. But I don't so think I everything think, not on the list is considered a natural, a natural plant. I think if it's not considered a native species, invasive or harmful, yeah, well, it's well, the opposite. Banana, I mean, that would that would that be would natural, natural to Wisconsin, <laughs> and that's not on the list. <laughs> Well, I mean, it also says naturalized to the state of Wisconsin because, well, right. that's, that's a question for all of it. The entire concept of nativity anyways, yeah. <laughs> at which point in time. Yeah, you know, and but the, the main goal is like, if people are doing this, you just don't want, want invasive harmful species. species. Okay. And, and those harmful ones will be in, in either uh, NR40 or with statute, with the statute here. So I, I think, there wouldn't be a good way to define native plants but definitively with, with an exhaustive list. So I think the, the best way forward is just to specifically disallow those harmful species that have been identified by the DNR. Okay. When I think about all of the dandelion seeds that have blown into neighbors' yards because of no May, I, I mean, I feel like it's almost more of a problem, the no mow may dandelions. That, and then, I, I don't know. I, I Is that is that obnoxious plant? Dandelion? Well, when you think about like 
fast spreading and invasive. You know, I think a dandelion might not be a native. I mean, I think there are native dandelions and none. I don't know. I just <laughs> they're not a, a they're not often welcomed by everyone. You know. Oh no. It's yeah. considered. I just googled it. Uh, it's considered naturalized. Okay. The dandelion. Again, the dandelion. I think it's because okay. it's like it's yeah. been here for centuries or okay. whatever it is. You know, so but it's right. okay. considered naturalized but not native. Right. According okay. to this article. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Okay. And that they are well utilized by bees and other pollinators and an early Im and important source of nectar. So yeah. they're beneficial. So. Yeah. So, I mean, if some milkweed seed blows over into a neighbor's yard, I mean, I guess the point is if any of these seeds blow into neighbor's yards, they would not be invasive. They would not be, you know, the neighbors could manage them easily. Is that kind of the general idea? Who are you asking? I'm just putting it out there. I mean, when oh, we talk okay. about like, when we talk about talking points, right? If, if okay. people have questions, if people have concerns, if people are worried about, you know, um, unkempt, un, you know, messy, you know, getting away from the tidy lawn that they love to see, um, I think what we're aiming for here is, you know, um, not manicured, but, you know, attended to and with mown boundaries and, um, you know, it's looks, it looks um, intentional was a big word that we heard over and over again um, on the uh, webcasts about no mo may, you know, we want it to look intentional. Like Rick, you have those lovely pads. Obviously there's intention behind that. Um, and as far as, I guess my point was, if people are concerned about the spreading of these taller plants, I think it's a very small risk, right? Because they're natural, they're native or naturalized or native, and they're not invasive, right? Well, I think the people that are worried about having plants like that grow in their lawn are already spraying their lawn with herbicides to right. kill broadleaf plants anyways, right? right. That's how it that's is what, on my block. There's those of us say. that do no mow may, and then there's yeah. those of us that spray chemicals all over their yard where nothing's going to grow other than grass, no matter what you do. Yeah, there's a very clear line between my lawn and my neighbor's lawns. Mm -hmm. I don't think yeah. my dandelions have the least bit of an mm -hmm. effect. Impact on so. that. <laughs> and they don't yeah. stand a chance, right? Yeah. <laughs> like there's so many chemicals across Nothing that lot. Nothing can live in that yard. No, it'll That's be fair. fine. <laughs> I mean, it, obviously we can all find the humor in that. I also kind of do wonder, are we, are we sort of like, um, has no mo may sort of made people dig in their heels even more and put even more chemicals on their lawn and just sort of like, I hope not, you know, I think, you know, slowly people are coming to recognize that having a colorful, having color in your grass is okay, you know, but yeah. Um, any any other concerns about the ordinance as written? Thor, you did so much great work checking with legal and all the departments, and um, you know, and public works definitely had a, a you know a concern, and then fair, we'll make our changes. Um, are we ready to for Rick and I to take this to city council for a vote, or are there still some additions or edits? I feel like we're sort of in a reasonable space here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could there be changes over time? Of course, because yeah. we may be modifying exactly. where we're going with all of this. And so I, I think that for now, this seems to, to be adequate. And if there's an issue, there's an issue and we can you know, deal with it. <laughs> can I'm okay was, with that. It can yeah. always be amended at the city council floor. So right. I, yeah. I, I so. agree that yeah place to move forward. Sue, I thought you said that perfectly, Sue. It's so true. We have to start somewhere. Let's just start. Um, so in that case, is there a motion to uh, adopt the new ordinance and send it to council? I will so move. Is there a second? To clarify that with, with your recommended edit from before. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Impossible, yes. but not a hill I will die on. As right. Right. Yeah. 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 If agreed upon by yes. Yeah. If public works, works says yeah. fine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is, is there a second? I will second. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Chris. 
<laughs> it's funny how that is. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. We're going to take this to council. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you for all your work on that, Thor. My goodness. That's great. Thanks. And then, Thor, might there also be updates to um, our uh, website, the sustainability pages, or would that be something you'd prefer to discuss in that work group? Um, and maybe pull some pull some folks folks from there to like help with updates to the web pages. Yeah, Just trying I mean, to think of if, if they're willing to, I'm always yeah. I welcome it because I do have limited wanna, time to work on this. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we bring that up? That sounds great. Um, I know that uh, we've kind of wrapped up the discussion on Nomo May, but I would be um, it would be irresponsible of me not to mention that uh, if you recall. You know, I'm always I'm a big fan of the spreadsheet. Oh boy! So we've got we've got that big work plan, and I was just going through it and updating it. And even if you don't have it in front of you, we have accomplished so much. I mean, all the little things that we said we were going to do. I'm just writing done, done, done on all these lines. We had um, we had some coordination with the library. We um, I mean, rewriting the ordinance was huge. Kristen recorded some lovely PSAs. They were just so sweet. She and her husband were adorable. I just had to stop what I was doing, especially during the time where you said, well, honey, and you like explained something to him and it was just <laughs> really adorable. It was very adorable for like teaching people about, you know, what's beyond no mo may. And it was just really lovely. We had we had two songs that were recorded for VMO. We had one that was Give Bees a Chance that was recorded by the Jingle Gals. We had we had um, For the Bees that was to the tune of Let It Be that the kids at the high school recorded. That received a lot of fun, positive feedback. Um, we have been, um, Ken, you may notice, you, you, Ken reached out to the school district and they had no Mome signs up at the district offices again. That was fantastic. We had social media posts. Um, we got some good conversations started with uh, parks. Like I said, DP, uh, public work participated. We had press releases, uh, a bookmark that was gorgeous. We had, you know, Kristen, and Ashley and Sue are starting to work on researching the Bee City. Uh, we've got a nice accumulation of resources that we can uh, draw on. Um, Ashley started working on researching the financial benefits of reduced mowing, which is huge. As Rick and I just very recently said, you know, this sustainability needs to be green in the sense of green dollars, right? We we have to always keep that in mind. It's um, it need, there needs to be something for everybody. We want to make sure it's financially uh, attractive. Um, we just we just did some great some great work, and I'm just so proud of everything. One one thing that we decided not to do is the bulb sale, and and I'm I'm happy with that. But if there really is, um, you know, some very uh, strong um, interest, like anything. Um, it all it all depends, you know, if there's willing folks that are interested in organizing it, I will support you. Um, I I do think it's nice that we I mean if there already are other organizations that are doing bulb sales, we could certainly help promote or support those uh, rather than try to do our own. But um I'm all ears. I'm open to suggestions. But as as things stand now, I don't think there's been any forward movement on that. I have an idiot question about bulbs because I'm not very much of a gardener myself. <laughs> but I did put have did put some bulbs in my yard um, a year or two ago. And I don't know if it's because of the drought, but I have had all my bulbs dug out mm -hmm. by, oh, by the little critters. critters. Yes. <laughs> and I just wondered if climate change had anything to do with that or and if they're just thirsty and they yeah. or, or if they're hungry or whatever i i did not know but i you know i think you know being watchful for whatever may be climate sensitive and i again i have no idea whether this is part of it but maybe somebody who has more experience than that. 
I'll just chime in. Squirrels and bulbs have always been a thing. Okay, so it's not new. <laughs> no, it's not new. <laughs> Even sometimes money. Squirrels and chipmunks it. seed ours every every year too. I, I think probably <laughs> okay. uh, twenty five to thirty percent of what we bury actually comes up in the spring, and the rest, <laughs> the rest is food for so for critters. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm just helping them. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's fine. All right. <laughs> you know so some. <laughs> yeah so it's nothing nothing against you susan that, that that's just everybody deals with that <laughs> right well, yes. i just wanted to make it i'm sure it was a green enterprise i can i can imagine every year just to beat the squirrels didn't you might be that. thinking that <laughs> you might be thinking the squirrels have something personal against you no no, no. <laughs> sorry um <laughs> I also wanted to make sure that we recognize uh, Kristen. She reached out to um, a, a subject matter expert at um, Wisconsin Public Television, was it? Um, would you mind just saying a, a couple of words about that? Sure. Um, in our many, in our several, in our lengthy discussion with our working group, um, you know, we were all kind of casting a wide net. But um, I discovered that Ben Fuda, who has a web series through PBS, um, I think it's Grow This, um, but I have to double check the title, but <clears throat> I reached out to Ben. He is the former um, director of the um, Allen Centennial Gardens. Oh. Um, and he has a lot of connections in the community here. I don't know that he's local. I think he's now on the East Coast, but um, we, we had two kind of objectives in reaching out to him. One was, you know, we are looking for a subject matter expert who could provide us some guidance on it, at the early stages of this initiative, kind of what maybe what, what we should know that we don't know, you know as we're moving through this. And secondly was, could he recommend local resources that we might partner with? And so Ben felt, you know, um, so he made himself available for a conversation that was scheduled for this morning, but he wrote last minute he needs to reschedule. But Thor and Teresa and I were just gonna have that conversation and especially important having Thor and Teresa involved because he felt that he could be most useful talking about the kind of ordinance, um, kind of policy municipality related, uh, our focus on creating that framework for all of this to happen to support a program. So anyhow, that is kind of where we're at with, with Ben. So I'll be out of town. I propose that we schedule this for the end of the month. So just kind of waiting for his availability. But we're hoping that that will kind of give us some traction for this next steps with the conversation with community volunteers and um, help us to have some kind of anchors in the ground with where we'll go with it. Thank That's you. What I have that. that was fantastic. And then also there was an amazing webinar that many of us attended and wasn't that presented by the Minnesota, um, yes. it wasn't UW Extension, I mean, UW Extension partnered, but it was really more the University of Minnesota that presented, correct? And it was all about, you know, bee lawns and how to grow a bee lawn, right? right. right. That was really incredible. <clears throat> that was wonderful. Lots of great ideas that came from that. All right. Um, are we ready to kind of? Is it is that a resource we could just highlight on a web our own website and say refer people to that for for information if they want more? Could you say that again, Susan? I may have missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Can can we? Is it? I don't know what the copyright rules are, what are you know, or whatever. But can we reference that site? on our site under any information we put up about the lawns so that others could connect and see that particular presentation. Are you referring, oh, the web, the webinar, the recording yes. of the webinar? Yes. I would love to do that. Yeah. I would love to do that. I, that's a really information packed webinar. Um, right. so, it, I, I just was so glad that I attended. It was so helpful. Um, what do you think, Thor? The recording was made available, right? It sounded like it was general space, but I, I just, I don't know. I like, go ahead, Thor. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't know, know either, but it looked like it was, you know, you could just 
beside that sign and anybody can pull it up. Yeah, just yeah, I can check. Um, and I think that would be great to have on the city website. Okay. Okay. Post the recording. All right, we'll put that on. We'll put that on you, Thor. <laughs> All right. Just to get that recording up would be so wonderful. All right. Um, so lots going on. So next, what I really wanted to do was, even though we're in the middle of June, I still think it makes sense to start talking about all campaign that focuses on um leaf management with adopt a storm drain being one of the strategies, just like pollinator habitat with no mow may being one of the strategies, very similar in that way. And in the past, what we've done is um, we've uh, had those green and blue uh, yard signs that people can pick up at City Hall. There were also some yard signs that um, the Leaf Free Streets um, organization had provided to us. If I'm getting that wrong, Thor, let me know. I think that's might be the name of it. And um, people would put those out and sort of a, uh, commit to keeping the storm drain clear. Um, or do you, is there a list of people that have already adopted a storm drain? I thought we were hoping to get that in the yes. past and I didn't see that. Yeah, so Brad I reached one. out to that from, from Brad and he, okay. he gave me the list, but um, request I didn't include it in the packet. You said that, I'm sorry, privacy. yes, okay. Yes. Um, so I instead just included kind of a breakdown of how many volunteers we had right. um, year over year. And let me pull that up here, share my screen. Yeah, that's wonderful. So the uh, good news is that we at least have a list. It might not be in the packet, but we have a list. Yep. Yes. Yep. And Brad did say that uh, and he, he wants any communication to the volunteers to go through him. Through him. Yeah. So he's happy for the committee to to plan what kind of communications they want to go out. But um, since he's the project manager there, he just wants to be that point of contact. Yeah. Understood. And the reason this, I bring this up now is be I'm sorry, Susan. No, that's okay. Go ahead. No. no. The reason I bring this up now is because I think it was Dan who actually had a, a really a great idea that you know maybe we could just leverage the volunteers that we already have. And perhaps we do a direct outreach to the folks that already have committed to adopt a storm drain and something, or we drop something off on their door, asking if there's some way that they could sort of help recruit more volunteers. Um, and I, Dan, if you're with us, and if I'm getting this right or wrong, um, I'd be interested in in hearing from you your thoughts on that. Um, if if I'm representing accurately what you had envisioned yeah i mean it was kind of the idea of the network effect people who are already you know impassioned about the program of just trying to do a little bit of canvassing kind of in their area of the city to do some additional outreach and if we even have specific i know brad has a lot of gis data it's like hey how many do you have within your reach that you might you know try to recruit and, and kind of get signups for. I think, aren't there over like about 400 storm drains in the city and a about, a, <laughs> I, I forget how many um, people, well, I don't know the updated. I, I, I had a lot of questions actually for, for, oh, one, what, how many? 156. 156 been adopted. drains, right. but not how many people now? now? 68. Volunteer 68, yes. So many people are doing multiple drains. Yeah, um, yeah I, I have four drains myself, and, and I'm <laughs> not on, included in that group because I never signed up. I know, that's why that's <laughs> my problem. <laughs> Brad, yeah. You do it on the, on the sly in the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a computer person. <laughs> no. That's no. But anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I have, uh, and I have, because I've done it myself and done it a number of years, and, you know, I've found it difficult to um, ask neighbors, but I have found over the years that more neighbors are 
seeing me do this ridiculous thing <laughs> and do it with more and more drinks <laughs> and and they start helping out you know on their own sometimes so then I think after they're a little engaged you know I, I might be more willing to say well I'm going to be away for a month can you <laughs> do, do this while I'm gone or something you know but I think I would like to know from Brad many things because um, there are safety issues there are location issues. There are some storm drains. I happen to be, my driveway happens to be the end of one of the worst storm drains in our area. I mean, it is a real collector of stuff. Um, other drains rarely collect much of anything because they're higher up on a hill and the wash comes down and it gets located, you know. So I would like to know what the more, you know, if, if most of the bad drains are being managed because I think that's, Definitely. I mean, it's very helpful for me if people upstream clean up their messes too, but before I get to them all, but, but it's, it's um, also kind of there, there are many other questions as somebody who's done this for a number of years, I would like to know from him and I'm wondering what the best way if I should just make a list and go through you to go through him. Um, but also just, um, I, it would be very, uh, very helpful to me to know what other people's experiences are like as for storm drain monitors and what issues they have, if he knows what those issues are so that we can address those in the, in the campaign and also what the highlights are and what, you know, are the positive things, um, in that. So, because there is a lot of stuff already out there and we can use a lot of that already. I, there may not need to be updates, but on the other hand, I think because it is kind of a, a well-known program in, in the city that we could build on that and, and do some extra things like link it in with the rain gardens or link it in with other things that we're doing. And also like the contaminants, the salt contamination, I think managing a storm drain in the winter is hell at least on my corner, because the snowplow leaves, you know, almost a, a, a car's width on that bend. There's this, you know, so I to get to the storm drain to allow it to drain, I have to shovel half the damn street. <laughs> so um, if so, we could just, so what I'm, so Susan, I, I, I I'm just right like to hear some of that. I, I, I know, I know where you're coming from. Um, okay. I guess what I'm wondering is, um, you know, some of the concerns you brought up might be addressed with, you know, some thinking through like what our messaging is going to be and strategies and communications. Sure. Uh, we have like the newsletter now that's really taking off very well. The right. e newsletter, we've got, you know, our website. We have among us an expert at bookmark making, <laughs> maybe, maybe right. Ashley could whip together another. Um, right. We have mm -hmm. a list of past participants. So, I guess, does it make sense to uh, have a, a work group that would meet outside of our monthly meetings and just get together and just like we had the spreadsheet and the list of all the things we're going to do for the SALT campaign and no May, you know, we just start another list and here's what we think we can accomplish. Here's what, here's how hard we're willing to work, right? Our mm -hmm. time and resources. Right. And we just put together our scope of the project and we get moving on it. I think a good first step would be to see if we could just map where the drains are in the city and which ones have been adopted. So oh, that there is one. That's online. We, we have, have all that, that information. Yeah. We because have like, that. we don't want to be doing door to door advertising. No. No, that already no. has all the drains adopted. Yeah. And Brad has on the a other hand, if that. you've got a street that has no drains adopted, if you get even one person to adopt a drain, you've made right. a huge difference, right? Exactly. So that's where we want to start. Isn't it's, that cool? Check that yeah. out. Yeah. So I think this is where we want to start. Yep. And then if if we have additional information, like which of these are particular problematic areas, mm -hmm. which drains actually collect lots of leaves in the autumn, right. Um, right. and versus which ones are you know normally clear gutters and require minimal work, we could we could be a lot more strategic in what we do. Exactly, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. And I think Brad may have a pretty good idea of that already but i you know that's why i need to talk to him because i or, or need you know directly to communicate with him because 
I'm pretty familiar with what has gone on in the past and, and where we are with this. I just don't know all the details that he knows of, you know, because he works with all the city crews and stuff too. So yeah, I would imagine that the street sweeper guys city? know the street sweeper <laughs> crews could tell you right away where the, the trouble spots are, right? You bet. Yeah, right. So I was at a prison for green dots. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a presentation some time ago at the library, and I was very, very surprised at how significant um, leave leaf management can really be. I mean, I, I kind of was thinking to myself, yeah, you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but surprising. It's really surprising. Mm, is adopting a storm grain the very, very best thing we can do, or do we invest in very, very, very expensive trucks that sweep the streets for us? You know, that's it's all, you know, but I think there is an impact to be made. The map with the red and green dots is wonderful. Um, looping Brad in is absolutely necessary. Um, I know that uh, Dan and, and Sue and Sarah had expressed an interest in maybe getting together and putting some ideas down about the leaf management. And then Sue, I know that you also did, but now you seem to be, are you more interested in staying on with like the B city stuff? Or I know your time is so limited. I just don't want to push you beyond your um, schedule allows, but I'm happy to have you wherever you prefer. Well, I, I don't know. I, um, it seems like you have a pretty big group going for the B city thing. I, I don't know as I am as valuable there. I mean, okay. I, I don't know. I'm. <laughs> What valuable wherever you <laughs> are. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, but but uh, you know, I, I feel like I kind of know this other program sure. quite well. I uh, the the timing is an issue for me too. I just don't know right yeah. my future very well. This is what makes it very hard for me. <laughs> but I don't want so I want other people there too because we're gonna all have to cover for each other. I, I think. Um, but, you know, so it's so times, nice but, case, but so I have this sense of this program and where you know because i've been with it so long so i i'm willing to go forward with it um i think we should i think it's good to have a group like you did for the b city you know i mm -hmm. mean if we can get some of these um storm drain people together i think that would be, you know they're already interested maybe we can reach out to them and say would anybody want to talk about those issues and let's work on what you think we should need to do and and then you know maybe either before or after with you know present all that to Ch uh, to brad if um if he hasn't heard it before if he's already heard it <laughs> and we needed to use it the other direction then i want to you know i'm sure brad i'm <laughs> sure brad has already heard it all before and and the meeting with him would be really for our education about what's already been done and well, I mean, from the community, if he knows kind of what what issues are coming back. Oh, I see. You what know, the push yeah, I want to know the community yeah. input as well as his his view of sure. it, both things. Okay. What makes um, it hard for them? What makes it unsafe for them? What you know? What is it linked to? Do they do it in the winter too? Does it need to ex be expanded to un so we un fully understand the impact of the storm drains? Yeah. Um, and, so and um, taking care of that. So in that case, I will courtesy copy you on um, both of the groups or just one, just the storm. Sure, that's fine. You can keep okay. letting me know. And you can yeah. join yeah. if you can. Right. And let's plan on, um, I don't know, Sarah, if you're all opened up now that the elections are behind us. And Dan, I hope you'd still be interested in just meeting with Brad and, and Sarah and um, figuring out some strategies for moving forward on this. Does that sound good to you? Yep. That's great. Okay, fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. It's and the work. only limitation I have right now is not not 805, but 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 is I I have uh, I'm going to be gone 
two weeks, the, the last two weeks in June and the first week of July. I will be back, but have- Would you mind emailing that to me, Susan? Because Sure, I was, yeah. because that, that be may be a fairly critical sure. time, I don't know, but you know, sure. certainly I'd like to gather some information maybe okay. before that and then, but there isn't much time left before that, so. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Um, that green and red dots all over that map, that really, that's, that's an eye opener, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that grid has a lot that we can learn. Okay. I'm going to move next on the agenda and we're going to keep moving and get out of here. Um, so this is kind of a big deal. Um, all right. So part of the discussion that we've been having sort of since um, I was assigned to this committee is, you know, what do we do with the Monona Sustainability Plan? Um, there is sort of this perception that uh, nobody's doing any work on it. Uh, we all know that work's being done um, from all the years that we've been volunteering with the committee, but um, I just can't easily prove the work that's being done. And long story short, Thor, with the permission of the mayor, Thor and I, and now Rick, have been meeting with department heads, and uh, we've been um, sort of just trying to understand uh, where work has fallen off with, with tracking the strategies of the sustainability plan. Um, I think a lot of communities, they all created plans and then started to pick off the low hanging fruit. And then when stuff sort of got difficult, and if you don't have, you know, city administrator, we've had some shifts, we've had some turnover, we've had turnovers in mayors. You know, if you don't have that strong, consistent message of leadership to let them know what they should be doing, people just aren't sure what they should be doing. Um, I think the Wisconsin DNR sort of recognized that this was happening, and the Wisconsin DNR came out with this program called Green Tier Legacy Communities. And um, the reporting that the Green Tier Legacy Program offers a given community like ours is surprisingly similar to the sustainability plan that Monona and many other communities uh, created. It has the, the sections, you know, air, water, land use general sustainability, solid waste. Green Tier Legacies also includes a component about sustainability and equity, which the city of Monona back in 2015, when the plan was first developed, we just weren't ready to, to bring that under the umbrella of sustainability. So even though at about 2019, so, so when the sustainability plan was first created, I've shown you that Brad started a spreadsheet, started tracking, and that sort of dropped off. At the same time, Green Tier Legacy was sort of picking up. And now the city of Monona uses Green Tier Legacy as a reporting mechanism. And it's similar and it's also superior to the sustainability plan in many ways. And it really is the tool that we're gonna keep using moving forward. The sustainability plan, um, you know, do we officially retire it? Maybe, um, maybe we keep it around just to sort of pluck out ideas that may not be captured here on this document. Um, Green Tier Legacy Reporting is a living uh, document, whereas our sustainability plan is just this fixed um, uh, 2015 document. Thor and Brad uh, now are filling out a new version of the Green Tier Legacy Re Annual Report, which is entirely online and um, much more interactive. Uh, it's data-driven. There's some reportable metrics, some really good um, oh, metrics. You know, It's got some numbers that we can actually uh, utilize and, and understand. So this is really the direction the city's been going in for a couple of years and will continue to go. And, um, and so all that I'm saying to you is also what Thor and Rick and I said last week, no, this Monday, at a leadership meeting with all the department heads uh, over at the city hall. So every other Monday, you know, each of the departments get together and they sort of debrief on what, what's on their plate. And the message was really, um, some of you may not be familiar with this because you're new to the city. Others will understand that the sustainability plan was adopted in 2015. Here's where we were. Here's the work that was done there. Here's this new tool. Here's where we're headed. How do you see yourself engaging, right? And that was sort of like the open-ended question. 
What are the challenges? Where are your points of pain? Um, a department like Public Works and Parks, they already do so much to satisfy the plan. It perhaps just is the case that nobody's really telling those stories. Nobody's really connecting the dots between the work that they're doing and the green tier legacy work. And we also know that even if green tier legacy or the sustainability plan never existed, these departments would be doing that work anyway. It's not as though we, it's not as though that these tools are the reason they're doing that sort of thing. Um, but we also know that and we ultimately we don't want sustainability to be just something that is done over here on the side by this little committee of you know cheerful people we want it to be a part of everything we do and so by meeting with all of the leaders all at once all around the same table everyone hearing the same message i thought i thought there was an awful lot of really good you know difficult to measure the soft stuff you know the relationship building um, it's very clear that everybody wants to do their part, um, so they sometimes just know, don't know what that looks like. For example, police and fire, they're going to have a list of ideas that's very different from public works, you know, um, and uh, we also talked about the need for sustainability initiatives to be financially uh, beneficial. We talked about that quite a bit. Um, the idea was floated. Uh, during one of our one-on-one -on -one meetings that perhaps each department just should have its own little sustainability plan. And what we mean by that is not that they would spend a lot of time creating a beautiful magazine style document, but rather just have maybe a list of 10 things. For 2024, this is what we're gonna work on. And maybe those 10 goals would be shared with the city council and the mayor, and it would be made known um, about what their goals are in the budget that is submitted every year to city council, maybe there would be areas dedicated to sustainability, mostly in the form of comparison. Here's an example. Fire chief needs a new truck or he is asking for a new truck. Here's the cost of a conventional truck. Here's the cost of a more, you know, an electric vehicle, for example, or whatever it might be. And then the council sees the difference and decides if it's worth it. Um, but those items would be sort of notated in the budget so that people are aware that the attempt is being made, but money is tight and people are being squeezed. So that's, uh, am I missing anything as far as the conversation we've had about the sustainability plan? I guess it was more information seeking, understanding where we're at, and then putting uh, putting that dis information out in front of the leaders of the city and, and asking for them to sort of brainstorm their own um, goals. And then actually, Thor, um, that very afternoon, our city planner emailed me with a lovely overture and he said, we've got some ideas for how we can make some changes to zoning and, and our ordinance changes that would really check off some boxes on sustainability. I thought that was so, so positive. So we'll get together eventually and talk with, with him. So already each department is thinking about what they can do, which is fantastic. One of the yeah. I, I do have a question. Um, I, I think it was the intention of the committee originally and, and in the plan also, if it didn't come out very well, <laughs> it was intended for, for each of these departments to develop their own capabilities to Agreed. incorporate sustainability. What would be, I think, interesting for us maybe at this point is if they do generate some 10 points or objectives they wanna meet this year, five objectives, whatever it is, they they that we could see those just in case from our broader perspective there's anything we see in that that either provides another opportunity or an additional opportunity or or we we'd like to hear more about that or something is that i mean i don't think we're an authority you, figure yeah here, you bring just, up yeah, you bring up a really good point in fact that reminds me of something thor said and perhaps he could elaborate that uh, perhaps one of the next steps, the Green Tier Legacies um, program has a very lengthy list of strategies and, and suggested actions, and Thor had suggested that maybe sometime soon, 
uh, he, there could be just sort of a circle back with department heads to to review those strategies and see which ones um, spoke to them, which ones they yeah, felt right were, were yes. doable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the the GTLC tool has pretty similar categories, sustainability plan, the energy, transportation, land use, water, quality, and conservation, solid waste, and then health and equity. So Brad and I were thinking that the most helpful thing we could do is kind of go through all of these the indicators, the, the, the core metrics that we're we're measuring here um, and can I identify which metric relates to which city department. And then as we're moving forward with meeting with departments and helping them create some, like what their sustainability capabilities are, we can tie them to those metrics and, and brainstorm ideas for how they can work towards improving those metrics. So we have alignment then with this Brockmaker plan across Exactly. For each of these individual areas who would be creating yes their own objectives. Right. Well, and things can change with time too. I, I think opportunities like you know, <laughs> you know, they the ability to do insulation a lot cheaper. Than, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to be able to you know reach out and grab those things and and do what maximizes things as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. um, and maybe bypass things that are intermediary and, mm -hmm. and get to the the end point quicker. Um, you know, there are lots of places that, you know, our sister, Madison sister city is all bicycles and, you know, a few a few buses. I think. It's not exactly designed like a Madison on an exclusive. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's just, I, I think they're, you know, they don't have this, there, there are no vehicle, no, no private vehicles at all. It's not electric vehicles. It's no private vehicles. It's, you know, they have bicycles or <laughs> so it, it's just like, what, how do we really move this issue of well, aspiration for yeah. faster? And, and is, is that something worth, you know, looking at with each of these different people? And sometimes it's relationship issues, like, yep. you know, certainly for, you know, a lot of things so and to your point about relationship issues uh, just this afternoon um, there was an email from the mayor letting us know that we have an accepted offer from a new city administrator who I feel is an outstanding uh, leader in this area I, I really do see him sitting down with this plan and the green tier legacy list of strategies and moving it through each department I, I couldn't be happier about that decision. He is uh, the current uh, economic developer for the city of Green Bay, um, lives in Sun Prairie with us, um, and um, just has a lot of really wonderful um, experience with sustainability and DEIB and all sorts of all sorts of things. So it's going to be wonderful. All right. Um, so uh, I guess the summary. The take home lesson here is that I think we're making, I think we've done some wonderful good. We've got the alignment, like Kristen said, we've got awareness, we've got sort of a re-engagement, a re-energizing, people are talking about it already, you know, Public Works is talking about the amount of salt that they've saved. It's just very interesting, all the conversations that are developing. So. Um, everybody wants to do this. Everybody wants to do the right thing. It, it, it's there's there's no reason uh, for any pushback. It's wonderful, and we'll keep you up to date as we move through that. All right. Um, <laughs> is there a, we have a lessons learned from the salt wise project? So we that we did we skipped six B. Oh yes, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Uh, perhaps Rick would like to speak to that. It's just about the EV charging. Yeah, right. the letter of support that was passed. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'll just be the messenger. Brad seems to, Brad Brew is in touch with the Office of Energy and, and Climate Change. Mm -hmm. At the, the county. county. Mm -hmm. At the county. And they're applying for a sizable grant to create a lot of new EV charging stations across the county. Mm -hmm. So the common council voted unanimously to support that support letter. 
So it happened very quickly. I think we had a very quick turnaround. They needed the letter this week. So um, we should hear by the end of the year, end of the year, something like that, Brad said, I think, mm -hmm. uh, whether we get this federal grant, whether the county gets a federal grant. Mm -hmm. And Monona will be a beneficiary of that for sure. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a simple thing to do, and everyone responded very quickly. And Brad seems to be very diligent about bringing these opportunities to our attention. So we're lucky to have him to be able to do that. And I guess he works very closely with the county uh, staff person that the county created there. So it's all to our benefit. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. and the county got some kind of national award. Like they're one of five recipients in terms of that department did yeah. on the county and climate the county did it's like oh, on a level with microsoft you. and yeah. starbucks and <laughs> i only find wow. things out by a press release so. <laughs> it a, they had a they had a press release yeah so it was like yeah, that sounds about right. a Dane county is like a national leader in this field and i was like so proud of what Joe Parisi and the whole county is doing in this regard. So it's all to our benefit. Yeah. That was wonderful. Yeah. And Rick, you were really also very um, on top of things when you immediately turned around and asked the mayor if you could um, add that to the city council agenda. And that was yeah. just really nice. Yeah. yeah. And she responded very quickly. And so that was, that was nice. Yeah. It worked very well. It's like a well-oiled machine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, how about SaltWise Projects Lessons Learned? Okay, um, I have a few slides, but I don't know if I'm connected, um, if I can share this. Do you? I, I did put them in the do you have packet, that? so let me pull that up. Oh, great. Unless you change the size. I've changed nothing. Less. Okay, <laughs> And I'll make this quick. All right, awesome. Thanks. So Lord, you can drive and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so together with Ashley, Grace, and um, and Thor and Teresa, um, we launched the Saltwise Outreach and Education Project this past winter. And um, we this is a brief summary of, of what we what our uh, what our goals were and what we achieved. So we'll go to the advance. So we understood and based our work on the premise that oversalting impacts are costly and permanent. And we worked on the uh, data supporting the impacts of um, salt intrusion on our lakes and waterways and ecosystems. And um, we just kind of built the business case to justify you know, the need for us to be taking action through awareness at this point. And so again, the 38,000 tons of salt were used on Madison and Dane County roads alone during the 2016-17 winter, polluting 29 billion gallons of water, which is almost equivalent to Lake Monona. Hmm. Uh, salinization of Madison's groundwater is increasing. It's difficult, it's expensive to treat, and Madison, the city of Madison is at risk for losing two of its um, wells due to salt intrusion. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very becoming a very real issue for, for impact. Um, in addition, just looking at the infrastructure around us, salt is corrosive to paved surfaces, so we understand how it impacts our roads, but also bridges and other structures. And just putting some, some metrics around that, that one ton of rock salt imposes $800 to $3,000 worth of damage. So <laughs> you know, distributed or not, it's it's significant. Next slide, please. So what were our project objectives? We sought to increase residential awareness of impacts caused by oversalting with the hope that it would prompt, motivate um, individuals to, to change behaviors. And we sought to do that by educating residents about proper salt application. Um, we sought to understand the current city's approach, our, our public works department's approach to salting practices. And so that's really where we began our conversation was just what are we currently doing right now? So we we got a nice education about the fact that, you know, city of Monona is currently um, 
implementing the SALT-WISE protocols, um, but are, is there more that we could be doing? Um, so we want to promote the city of Venona best salting practices broadly so that we can let residents know, hey, the city is taking a leadership role. You know, these are the efforts we, we're doing. Um, and are there feasible changes to align with sustainable best practices that we're not doing that we could explore? So we'll advance this slide. Thank you, Laura. So we began with the strategy of educating and education and outreach. And this we aligned with the approaches provided in the SaltWise program. So we created a printed educational content for municipal school and business locations. And that included, you know, we're looking here on the table at the beautiful bookmarks for our um, for our no mome pollinator promotion. But Ashley did some beautiful bookmarks as well for the salt wise and salt awareness that we distributed to schools. Um, MG21, Winnipeg School, the high school. Um, we distributed up and down. Ashley and I divided Monona Drive north and south, and we distributed. Um, we had window planes for businesses so that they could champion this effort and give some visibility that way. Um, re we recorded a PSA or two at WBMO. Um, and um, Kudos to Thor and to Teresa with all of the work just through the webpage, our sustainability committee webpage, and also our community newsletter. Um, we had some collaborative effort putting language together around an article. So we really kind of cast a broad net on, on providing visibility through the outreach. So next slide, Thor. Success measures, these included um, creating some baseline program elements, right? So education of local schools, businesses, and residents uh, on these best practices. City public works salting practices, aligning them with the SaltWise program guidelines, and then laying a foundation for the SaltWise campaign in future years. So um, it will, uh, so next slide. I'm kind of forgetting what I put in these slides. It's been a while. <laughs> so I mentioned, so some of these outcomes to support these success measures. I, I just kind of gave you the rundown on what we distributed, um, including the cling. So I kind of got ahead of myself here. Um, we spent $85 for 50 window clings and got those distributed to 39 businesses along Monona Drive. I think we have some extras. They don't, um, they are not dated, so they can be further distributed next, you know, this coming winter season. Um, we now have a winter salt reduction resource link on our sustainability uh, community webpage. And we now have some kind of pre-canned, you know, community newsletter content as well. And that, that went out. So these are outcomes from, from the outreach goals that we had. Next slide, please, Dora. So next steps and future ideas. Well, with what we learned, we realized that we would benefit by collaborating with the city of Monona Chamber of Commerce to increase visibility with our business partners. So really step forward and lean into that. Expanding our residential communication to include mailer inserts through things like our tax statements um, or other avenues if those are available to us. So we need to explore what those could be. Increasing overall the visibility of the campaign. So, you know, how, we need to brainstorm on what some other tools are for us to use. Start messaging earlier in the winter season, of course. Um, and then really putting in place a formal program for businesses to participate in and to receive recognition for their leadership in the program. And then coordinating with our schools in a similar way um, in terms of giving student credit for collaboration with, with project you know, focused initiatives. So. Um, I think we have one more slide, or maybe this that was it. out. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for bearing with me this hour. <laughs> but does anyone have any questions or comments? You back, Teresa. You're on mute. Mute. Sorry, there I go. Um, so when you say uh, that maybe in the future years you'd like to start a little earlier, uh, when would you say would be a good time to start? I think that we really got our start in late, mid to late November. Yeah, I might be misremembering, but it might just give us a little more time, especially if we want to 
collaborate more and develop this partnership with the chamber. Maybe we start the conversation a little sooner, maybe October. Um, yeah. Just to start greasing the wheels and given the frequency of meetings we might attend and present at, this would give us a better lead time for that. They meet quarterly, MESPA, Eastside okay. Business Association. So good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it includes more than just Monona, it includes parts of Madison. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. So who's the contact person there? Christine, somebody? Christine. Christy, do you know her last name? Go for it. No, no, no not, not anymore. Her anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, we're it's it's too thing. removed. Um, it's a safety. Yeah. 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 They hired her. Yeah, Devin person. and uh, but I can't up. remember her name. I'm sorry. Fine. Yeah. I'll find out. Yeah. Thank you. I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. But Christy definitely. Christy Welter. There yes, you go. Yes, that's Thank Welter. you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, would you like us to have like an introductory email between you and Christine? That would be great. Okay, Teresa, yeah. And um, Brad just sent out uh, a spreadsheet that showed okay. salt use per lane mile. And on average, Monona was ahead of the group. That's great. Um, but do you, did you get that? I did. did. Yeah, let, let me could you share it with the group yeah. and then you'll have it for future presentation. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Also, a question, a question about inserts, because I, you know, I think increasing visibility and getting it in people's mailboxes right. it is, is just so important, as, especially as you get closer up to an event, just kind of over and over giving little pieces of something, you know, reminder, reminder, reminder. Um, and I'm just wondering, have we got good sources for doing that with, I mean, how, how does that happen and how much expense is involved or can, can it just be slipped, you know? <laughs> you mean for PR purposes? For PR purposes, yeah. Like for, getting these into the uh, tax statements or? Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, or yeah, well, yeah, tax statements, but that's not that's once a year, you know. Right. It's not, so on a uh, yeah, yeah. Are there things that go out like in the? I don't know what things people get. All there's certainly plenty of mailers in my mailbox. <laughs> Can't we attach it to the edge things? Well, you so know, we did. Um, we put a we put a flyer in the and Mesra I think is the one that puts the summer and fall guides together. They do those mm -hmm. like the magazines. And we did do a flyer in that. Okay. It wasn't actually a flyer. It was like a page in the guide. Um, oh, okay. Remember the the yellow and like where I had sure decided I it. I, it was in 2020, so it might have been oh. blur. Um, <laughs> we had a big, you know, we had that big campaign planned. Oh, okay. <laughs> All of the focus on solar energy stuff, and we did yeah. get. Oh, okay. We did have a flyer in there. I don't remember. But there isn't even a guide anymore, is there? That, but <laughs> like that? Are you talking the Monona guide? The yeah, they guy? do like the the magazine. Is there still a quarterly? Or? No, I think they did it twice. Or I'm pretty sure they still do it twice a year. Oh, honestly, I don't know. I recycle I everything I get anyway. But if it was, frankly, if it was in there, I wouldn't see it. See, I, you know, you just dump it. Yeah. So I, you know, that's I don't the know. Yeah, that is the problem. Do things too. like that, but. I don't know. I don't know what the best way is to get, you know. You know what? Food. When uh, when Kristen meets with Christine, that could be one of the questions that we absolutely she talks. Yeah, that's great. And I see Thor's got it displayed here, that pretty crazy graph that Brad sent out. I mean, talk about like the timing of this email. It's so spot on with our meeting tonight. Yeah. But, yeah. Um yeah, Monona's doing all right. So this Very is well. per lane mile of salt. Wow. Yes, I'm I, very sure as well. Yeah. yeah. I um I asked Brad, like, what is Sun Prairie doing? Like, look at how they decreased like that. It was incredible the reduction that they made um like in 2020. He thinks that maybe they have fewer hills. I was just gonna say <laughs> hills. <laughs> yeah. Because Monona is all up and down yeah. everywhere. And it yeah. makes it really hard not to isn't that interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, but, and then there's county roads which aren't yes into this. that's exactly exactly the county roads are pretty flat yep. usually yep. Too. <laughs> yep. it's gone the wrong way yeah, well, those yeah. Were yeah. yeah. the other thing is oh. you know would there be like 
you know, neighbors that we could identify that would pass out little, you know, handouts to, or, you know what I mean? Is there some kind of a little distribution system we could kind of get set up of sympathetic <laughs> folks? Well, you know, to, you know what? I mean, I'm just trying to think, what, how do you reach people that they're going to pay attention to it? You know, and Have you so done the Eco Tuesday thing? So if I could interrupt, because sure, it is sure. 8.36, and we've been here for two hours. <laughs> Another discussion. <laughs> okay, and we yeah, have some, sure. and we, and I just want to respect everyone's time. And so what I'm hearing from Kristen is that we start in October. There's no reason we cannot start in September. And so the ideas that are coming out of this meeting tonight for the next, for our 2023 SaltWise campaign, 2024, yeah, we want to be able to capture those. So um, sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure that we keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I did want to uh, share um, that um, under the important updates from committee members, if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump down to number eight and take this out of order. Um, I'm just going to jump around here. Uh, so possible energy task force, I've talked to you about this before. So one of the things that came about from our meeting with leadership um, and with my meeting here and with past meetings that this committee has had when when Alder Moore was the chair, and I know Ken has been involved with this. Um, at the school, we talked about how the school district just basically got all their energy data, got all their roof replacement schedules, plotted it all out. Like this is how we meet our green energy goals in the next 10 years. And um, I, I know Ken's been um, preoccupied with uh, some other stuff in his life. Um, I think we're all aware that there was a house fire that he was uh, working through. But um, I've also been reaching out to other people in the committee, in the community who might could be part of sort of a group of folks that just takes that data from Brad and analyzes it and plots it out on a calendar or on a, not a one year calendar, but you know, like over the next 10 years or so, because the city of Monona, as you know, has a commitment to 100% clean energy. And so we need to make sure that we're reaching it. We've got a public safety building that's gonna be, you know, built. We've got opportunities to do things right in construction. So I, I'm hopeful to have more updates uh, to you as that sort of um, starts to really get some traction, which I'm very excited about. Sustainability in the My Monona newsletter, number 8B. Um, the Monona Community Media Committee has the My Monona E newsletter. And just tonight, uh, the meeting just before this one, um, it was agreed upon that they would have a dedicated space just for sustainability, not so much for our committee, but for everybody in the whole city to like share two, three bullet points, a success story here or there. This chart that Brad shared with us something like that. We put it out in the my own own. <laughs> we just put it out in the newsletter. You know, we just, we want to share those little success stories so that citizens know that government is leading by example, which is, I think, pretty critical in, in, in my mind. We talked also about, did I already say this to you? Um, in some of the meetings that Thor and I had and, and Rick with like uh, the chiefs, the fire and, and police chief, was it, was it Chief Cheney that said he tires for a squad car that were made of soybeans and they were less costly they lasted longer recyclable I mean it was one of those things that that would be a great little you know success story that we can we can um sure. include in the newsletter so this all sort of also circles back to another theme about what is the purpose of this body what is the purpose of this committee? You know, with the Green Tier Legacy Program well underway, with the new city administrator, with the conversations with city leadership, with the buy-in, our role, you know, we still have the role of a community-facing organism, a community-facing body, um, and in citizen engagement, which we were doing a fabulous job. Um, Ideas that came out of some of the meetings, Rick will remember, we talked about, does this body focus on storytelling? Is it our job to like tell these good stories that are of all the positive work that's already being done, all the success stories that are out there, like the car tires and uh, 
Monona Fire uh, Department has has done away with all of its carcinogenic uh, firefighting foam, right? I didn't know that. That's amazing. That should be front page story. That's a wonderful sustainability uh, win. So are we the body that sort of is the storytelling body? Do we look for grants, right? We talked about the Inflation Reduction Act, and I'm going to lean heavily on folks like Ken to like keep your eyes peeled for financial opportunities coming down the road. So um, just, I just am very hopeful there's a lot of good things going on here. And so to wrap it up, my Monona E newsletter, if you're not already subscribed to that, um, you can find out how on the city news, city website. All right, 8C Green Neighbor Project. Um, our guest is, has left. <laughs> but maybe yeah. we circle back with him for a previous uh, meeting. But Sarah, would you like to say a few words? That was something you brought to our attention. Yeah, so I mean, I, I was um, thinking in this meeting, we could discuss whether we'd like to have him come and do a presentation similar to the presentation we had at the top. Um, so I, he reached out to me and um, he actually lives in Monona. He, well, he just moved here about a year ago, but he runs a nonprofit called the Green Neighbor Project that is focused on helping people assess the opportunities, like, you know, similar to focus on energy, but there are other programs that aren't connected to the actual utility that can provide you with similar types of benefits on um, accessing renewable energy opportunities and doing the group solar buys. And it's essentially like a digital toolbox is how he kind of describes it, where you put in your address and you get kind of a customized, you know, yeah, that. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so and he runs it and, you know, as a Monona resident. And so he was just reaching out to me to learn more about kind of, you know, well, frankly, he reached out for the county board side. But um, as he was talking, you know, it just seemed more and more like something that this committee would maybe be interested in knowing more about. And given that he's he is one of our neighbors um, and, you know, is basically because it's a nonprofit, it's just there to share information with people and advocate for people and give them opportunities to engage on renewable energy opportunities, um, you know, for free without any, you know, so, yeah, so I just was kind of wanting to bring that to this group and see if this group would be interested in um, having that as a future agenda item for him to come and do a, you know, 15, 20 minute presentation about um, what they do, what their goals are, what they can do for for Mononans and, you know, and maybe other future ideas that we might have for ways we can learn from the resources that they've already, you know, been putting together, so. Yeah, yeah no, that sounds great. great. Yeah. It's really great that he's from Monona. That's really cool. Yeah, I know. It was really yeah. that, as soon as he, you know, <laughs> he's, yeah. yeah. He is. I, think they, I think they were all in Minnesota when it started um, and then, I, I don't know why he moved to Monona because we're great probably, but um, <laughs> so now he's here. <laughs> um, I think the rest of the team is still based in Minnesota, but he's not. So, you know, yeah. That's really cool. You know, I mean, if nothing else, this would be an example of something that the My Monona newsletter could put in its sustainability corner. You know, mm -hmm. you're the Monona citizen doing amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. right? That's cool. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know what the but I mean if if um if we think that that could be a future agenda item, I could just connect him with Thor or with mm -hmm. whoever yeah. would yeah. be the scheduling to figure out which meeting he yeah. comes to. Yeah. Sounds great. Right. Awesome. Okay, for sure. For sure. As many options as you can have, you know, so you yeah. can evaluate what. You know, and it's yeah, it's nice that he's here do, to know, be able to wonderful. speak to our right, you know, the ecosystem that we're sure. in. Sure. So. Yeah. You can refer. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to brush really, brush really quickly over eight D and E, and we can um, forward to you in an email something that Brad sent our way, which is a sustainable deconstruction policy. And I'll just forward that email to you and just uh, let you have a look at that. Nothing really that uh, um, we need to talk about right now, just something that we might want to think about for the future. And then um, I just thought we'd throw on the agenda, the 2024 Memorial Day Parade. Rick and I were walking home from the parade and kind of just 
musing about ideas for next year and what we might do. And I shared with him that, you know, at one point, Alder Moore had jokingly told us a story about how there's a lawnmower brigade in her hometown where people do that. And then, and Rick and I just had some ideas about, you know, how we could use the opportunity to distribute information about the pollinator campaign. I'll just put that on the spreadsheet for future consideration uh, related to that campaign. Circling back on diversity, equity, inclusion, I guess I'm really just um, for number seven. I just would say I'm really impressed that the Green Tier Legacy uh, reporting tool has that built right into it. So that's really wonderful. Um, I had a citizen approach me uh, for some time now. We, he and I have been talking about his concern with the property assessment of, of Monona's properties. And he framed it entirely as a equity issue, which I thought was fascinating, you know? Um, but I think there's always opportunities to think about equity and, um, and how we make Monona a better place. And I'm really looking forward to talking with him more about, about that. And that does bring us to the end of our agenda. If, is there anyone who has more they would like to share or discuss or ask? Just one thing, um, Laura probably knows more about this than I do, but the city is, gearing up to do a new comprehensive plan by 2026. Yeah, we'll have to have it published by, uh, by 2026. We're obligated to, to do one every 10 years and our last one was published in 2016. So, And so sustainability could be a major component of that. Absolutely. So Absolutely. the conversations we're having with departments might yeah. Build a foundation for something more long range yeah. than just one or two years in the future. Yeah, no, I'm really, the high, timing is really, really very nice with that. Yeah. Anything else? Just the person you mentioned talking about diversity, equity, and all yeah. that. Uh, is that somebody who would be interesting in sharing perspectives here? If, you know, no, I just wanted not to share. For anything particular, no, just, you know. no I, I think our agendas are so heavy right now. We've been here over for two hours. I don't I don't know if it's really, but it, but I, I invited him to speak at a city council meeting because you know it's a, it's a very interesting angle on on an issue that a lot of people have concerns about, and he's coming at it from a very different angle, which might just. Uh, open people to other. I always think that's yes. important. Yeah, <laughs> I, it was very, very good. Yeah. So which which meeting is he coming to? <laughs> yeah, I, to. I don't know if it will happen. Oh, um, right. is there is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Rick, you can second. <laughs> <laughs> Take turns now, kids. Is there a, all in favor of adjourn? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness yeah it's what a long one it's a big one but you know i i am